to do this discussion today we have uh, a very interesting set of people uh, kiran oriardon is a, a senior policy advisor at open forum europe uh, he has been working in brussels uh, since 2004 with a fo focus on the european union's uh, policy particularly around copyrights and patents uh, he has also been working on community engagement for the drafting of the version 3 of the gnu general public license Uh, he's been a user of uh, gnu linux and free software since 1998 and his work has focused on software policy but also included automotive policy uh, the general uh, data protection regime and corporate finance he studied law at uh, university saint louis brussels before moving to brussels kiran worked as a uh, kiran worked as a software developer in dublin uh, we also have uh, Rahul Kulkarni, who is the chief technologist at Samagra, which is a mission-driven consulting governance consulting firm. Uh, at Samagra, Rahul leads digital transformation across state governments in India, uh, using a unique model of leveraging open-source software and building capacity of internal teams within the government. Rahul is also co-founder and partner at Do New, which is a social enterprise. creating the pedagogy and practice of mentorship to help individuals and teams realize their potential uh, rahul is also a startup founder he served as the chief product officer at socrati an ad technology startup which was acquired by densu and uh, before entering and before starting up socrati rahul basically uh, spent 6 years at google uh, he was google's first product manager uh, and he helped Build some of the key Google products. Uh, I think some of you may not even have heard of Orkut, but it was the predecessor for uh, Facebook. Uh, interestingly, he's also you know worked with um, uh, in Silicon Valley. He's worked with uh, a bunch of organizations uh, like LabVIEW and uh, TX, and he basically worked with uh, customers like NASA and CERN. So. So thanks Rahul and I think the interesting thing about Rahul is that he himself holds about nine patents. Uh so just to kick off today's discussion I'll uh, give a quick background on what's happening with software patents before I uh go over to Kiran and ask him the first question. Uh in India uh in 2005 uh, the uh, the patent amendment act was passed and uh, when that amendment was passed there was uh, quite a fight going on between the pro patent lobby and the anti patent lobby uh, the amendment basically the draft amendment basically said that technical effects of software are patentable subject matter and um, the anti patent lobby basically said that there is no software that has no technical effects so in essence we are asking for all software to be patentable and um, one thing led to another and ultimately the section 3k of the indian patent act uh, was uh, retained in the old format which basically said that mathematics business methods computer programs per se and algorithms cannot be patented uh, now you know in ordinary english you and i would interpret per se to mean that uh, software is intrinsically not patentable subject matter uh but when lawyers do their magic i think uh, the sausage that comes out at the other end of the machine is a very different product compared to what you and i imagine it to be uh so so what happened after the law was passed and the parliament basically uh changed section 3k it was that the indian patent office created a draft patent manual and uh, when folks in the open source community looked at the draft patent manual to our shock we saw that the patent manual <laughs> has the exact same language that was thrown out by parliament so the draft patent manual basically said uh, interpreted section 3k as saying that technical effects of software will be patentable uh why is this important uh, because i think for the fast community one of the reasons for this to be important is that 
if you look at fast it gives you the freedoms to you know uh, to use uh, modify redistribute uh, etc and software patents are kind of a uh, antithetical in some ways because you have systems and methods that you know are monopolized by one individual or a corporation and you know what methods like say one click shopping etc so whether you implement it in free software or open source or proprietary software uh, you are liable for uh, violating those patents so uh, the fast community has been uh, deeply opposed to software patents uh, and this battle is going on now in india for almost 18 years outside india it has been going on for a very very much longer period of time uh, so with that let me go to kiran and uh, you know uh, request kiran to explain to us why the fast community is so deeply opposed to software patents and of course one of the most vocal uh, opponents is uh, richard stallman who is the founder of the free software movement over to you kiran thanks thank you yeah so the the interesting thing about the fsf's work on uh, software patents is that people sometimes think of the fsf as being in charge of leading a software project but really their goal has always been make sure that people have these freedoms and then do whatever work has to be done to make this happen and that's why you know the gnu project is the software part of fsf's work but then you know they also are working to uh, develop this philosophy uh, developing licenses which include clauses about patents uh, working on advocacy and awareness and working on legislative issues and so this is something that they've been raising awareness about since the 90s uh, in america at least uh, so they the 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 issue then if it it got proposed in in Europe and uh, I began working on it then uh, at the time I was working with uh, Free Software Foundation in Europe uh, but I, well, I was working for Free Software Foundation Europe but we were working with Open Forum Europe at the time on this topic and so that that's 20 years later we're uh, still working on this topic in Europe so it's a it's, it's a difficult subject so the the reason that this topic has taken so much work is that so uh, as you probably know like copyright covers something that you have made patents cover an idea and so the difficulty here is that a lot of free software projects would focus on trying to write new software to replace a piece of proprietary software so it's the ethic is you know if it just takes hard work we'll do it we'll do the hard work that's you know that, that's something we're able for the problem then with with patents is that they they block the implementation of an idea of a certain uh yeah. functionality in the software and so sometimes these can be just inconvenient uh the the sheer number of them can create uh, a lot of problems uh, but sometimes it's possible to avoid a certain idea it gets more complicated then when you get into things like data formats mm-hmm. so if there is a, a patent on a way to sort th- things alphabetically or numerically then you might be able to def- to find a new way to sort them alphabetically or numerically but if you have a patent on a data format and it's required th- then if you don't use that patented idea you are not putting or reading the data in the correct format and so this is it, it makes it impossible to implement that functionality and then so this is the data formats are the the, the worst of, of of software patents but then the worst of the worst are, are video patents because in this situation for most video uh, software for encoding and uh, decoding because with web chat now we're constantly encoding and decoding uh, you need to have hardware acceleration and so for software to be able to read and write in a format first off you have to make the standard uh, then you have to get the hardware manufacturers to accept to put this into their hardware and then you have to wait 5 years so that everyone has bought a new laptop in the meantime and then hardware exists for this format and uh, if at that point somebody comes along with a patent and says you've violated this patent there's really no way to get the software out of these computers and there's uh, the you know if you want to make a new format then you have another 8 years of developing a standard getting it into the hardware so in this sense software patents are uh, the the big problem with software patents is that 
sometimes there is no way around them other than don't write the software. And that's, uh, that, that's a that's big problem. That's not an option. Yeah. That's not an option. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kiran. I think, uh, you know, I'll go to Rahul next. And Rahul, you had a really long career in the IT industry. And uh, so, you know, from, from your perspective, uh, and you yourself hold nine patents. So, from your perspective, can you share, you know, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of software patents? Oh, great. Uh, so, you know, software patents, first of all, we just need to look at what does software patents mean to start with? Uh, what is software? Now, software is built on math and logic, uh, built over the years, right? Now, nobody has patented things in math and logic. Imagine Aryabhat had said, zero is patented now or trademarked or copyrighted now would we have one zero and next to the zero you'd have a little nice tm there or you know with a star asterisk wherever you use zero you'd have to put in protected by patent number this and this under this code and this thing right um so software is built on collaboration um uh, you know newton did not patent calculus and so as you think how math has evolved over the time Everything that we do in software is essentially a manifestation of that mathematics, that logic that we have encoded using a programming language run under a compiler. Now, so each one of those pieces of software that exists have been built over the last person, right? Over somebody's effort. Uh, we are all just look around. Every piece of software that you are using is open source. Now I'm running Linux here. Um, I'm running Firefox here. All of those things here are open source and built on something that someone else has built and not just yesterday it's built a decade ago so in that sense i would say software patterns is an oxymoron uh, that really kills patterns there are too many disadvantages too many cons to patterns uh, as such but if you think of what are the pros right is there what are the advantages of patterns um even after having those i think nothing really i i can't see a real good value to justify patterns other than one thing, maybe it gives people recognition for that little time for who, those who understand patterns. I personally would say having papers in journals, uh, you know, if uh, somebody had written the paper on how to run blockchain, right? How to do bitcoins, uh, that paper, or mm -hmm. then the paper that uh, Jeffrey Hinton in 1986 uh, wrote a paper on backpropagation. Uh, like, I would be proud to have written something like that, right? I don't, but I would have loved to. So I, I would have a better um, respect for people who have written things like that in a paper and published it out there as opposed to having patents. Now, thanks to the fact that I was in certain companies and they used to have a battery of lawyers to be able to do this. So suddenly you have patents. But at the end of the day, uh, what does it give you? Uh, not much. And I really appreciate the work GNU Foundation, Free Software Foundation or Open Invention Network do to try and, you know, for those who have the patterns, you know, can you ensure that they are given to a foundation or they're at least you know, signing off something that says you won't sue Linux Foundation or you sue something. You won't play that suing game here and there. It's not a court battle. It's a battle of engineers or collaboration with engineers. So I think overall, um, my stand on software patents, in spite of having those, I strongly um, oppose them because I don't see the need for it. It's killing collaboration. It's killing innovation overall. Thanks, Rahul. Kiran, uh, you have a global perspective because uh, you have worked for FSF. You also now currently work with FSF Europe. So, uh, what do you know? Can you give us a global perspective on what's happening with software patents? And also, in your remarks, you said that you know this whole thing has been going on for about twenty years. And in my remarks, I said that in India, we've been fighting this for what about eighteen years. So, uh, why is it such an intractable problem? Why is it that, you know, pushing back on software patents is such a hard job? Yeah, it's, it's quite, it's a, it's a quite a complex issue. So, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the, the three places I worked, uh, first Free Software Foundation Europe, then Free Software Foundation, and now Open Forum Europe, all, all three of them working on this topic. And so the, like the, the complexity can be seen in, in when people ask the question, like, are software patents valid? And so the thing here is, you know, it depends on where you look, because if you look at the legislation, then you'll see the software is not patentable per se, or software is not patentable as such, or th there's various different ways to interpret the legislation, but that doesn't give you the answer. You then have to look at, well, what's, you know, what, what's happening with this legislation? And, and the next thing you can look at then is you can look at the patent office. And, you know, when you look there, 
are they granting software patents? And in a lot of cases, yes, they are. So if you looked at that, then you might conclude that software patents do exist or are valid. But the real answer only really comes when you have a court that gives you an answer to the question, is it valid to have a patent on an idea that is implemented in software? And so in that sense, it's it's a bit complex, but it, it actually becomes simple when you look at the jurisprudence, because there are actually only court cases on this in maybe six countries. So there are court cases about software patents all over the world. But in most court cases, people are looking at the question of, did this company use that company's idea or the question of who invented this first was it this company or was it that company they usually don't ask the judge to make a decision on the question is it even valid to have a patent on something that is implemented in software and so so the situation is a little bit simple in when you look at just the jurisprudence on one hand now then when you do look at the jurisprudence the next thing is that because there are so few cases and you know, sometimes years go by between each of these cases. It's it's also not clear. You know, is a ruling from seven years ago, is that still valid? Has that been you know changed by the the, the law? And so the situation at the moment is uh, in the USA, where you have the most court cases, there has been a lot of good. There have been two good rulings by the Supreme Court. This is the the Bilski and the Alice rulings, and they were then used after those two rulings to invalidate patents for being software patents. So in this sense, the the case law uh, has been going in our favor. Now, I was on working on different projects in recent years, so I haven't followed the recent uh, jurisprudence of the lower courts in the US. I hope it's continued to go in that direction, but I, I that's something I, I would love to talk to an, an expert about myself. Uh, but there is, you know, there's good jurisprudence there in the US. In Europe, we don't have much in terms of jurisprudence. We, we have a few cases and we can, you know, have, we have theories of how this would apply to larger cases. Uh, and we also have a, a situation that there is currently no European court that deals with, with patents. And, but there may be this year or next year a court put in place. And so this could be the course that creates Europe-wide legislation, uh, or sorry, uh, case law on the topic. Uh, so it, it's it's difficult. It's, it's you, you can make the argument that software patents probably don't exist uh, or are not valid. Uh, but the problem is we don't have clarity on this. We don't. So what we really need is to clarify the legislation and then get a court ruling based on this clarified legislation. And that would give us uh, a little more peace of mind about whether they whether they're a risk or not. I imagine that clarification and getting court rulings would take at least a decade or so. It, it depends. It, with the, there's a lot of people worried in Europe with this uh, unified patent court and how it might be very favorable to patent lawyers uh, due to how the staff were chosen. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe if they gave us a clear ruling, maybe this is what would be needed for the software community to get organized and say, you know, okay, well, if that's the way it is, then now we do need to change the law. So, you know, things things can move slowly. You know, we've also in Europe, we've had very little legislation on this. And uh, I think it's been similar in India. And then all of a sudden you have you know, some new legislation proposed on AI or uh, in Europe, we have new legislation being proposed on standard essential patents. And you know, then we have to see, well, is this something we have to do? Are there opportunities here for, for getting a good change into the text? And uh, and yeah, so then some, a lot of the time there's very little happening, but sometimes things can move fast as well. Hmm. So uh, let me go to Rahul. Uh, Rahul, one of the uh, the parli- there was a rec- recently there was the one sixty first committee uh, of the the parliamentary standing committee, and uh, one of the recommendations is that because AI is growing rapidly, we need uh, patents on AI. Uh, what is I know that you know we have discussed this in the past. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, let me tell you, if you take AI, artificial intelligence in the loose way it's used right now, uh, let's uh, let's think of neural networks. Let's look at the core techniques behind AI. These were all developed 50, 60 years ago. In fact, Warren and Walter Pitts in 1944 
at the university at chicago had proposed the first neural network construct then they moved on to mit in 1952 and then they built up research in cognitive sciences then i had mentioned earlier right jeffrey hinton in 1986 proposed back propagation as a technique that has really that's still what we use we still use back propagation we still use these things then reinforcement learning came around and so on but all of these techniques are at least 20 to 30 years old then what changed what has changed is the availability of data for training, extremely powerful computers, GPUs for running that model. And then uh, this data, right? That data we are talking about training, whose data is this? Nobody created data. This is your data. This is my data. This is data of artists. This is the data of creators, brothers, all of them who have written their own copyrighted material, put it up on the web. And now suddenly you're saying, Someone can come in, someone who has not invented back propagation, someone who has not invented the neural network, that someone comes in, takes data, not their data, takes your data, takes my data, takes the artist's data and trains that model on them by hitting a run button, right? They're really not doing anything much to it. There exists so many open source models out there that you can just use for training and you hit run, you get a model that works, you put a pretty UI on it in an app. And now you suddenly want to patent that application. You know, it just makes no sense. What about the creator of the content that you trained it from? What about the inventor of the algorithm that you're actually using to run this? You know, if they had patented this, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. And so these guys were generous enough. What did Jeffrey Hinton, uh, 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 Jeffrey Hinton in 1986 do? Publish a paper, not mm -hmm. a patent, a paper. You know, that's how um, science works, that's how mathematics works. You publish papers when you have something unique and you help the world collaborate on top of it. And so this construct of AI applications getting patented, I think is a huge um, uh, step in the wrong direction. Uh, it will kill collaboration. It will be a first mover kind of advantage uh, to whoever has that. And most importantly, it will only be in the hands of whoever has um, uh, the um, uh, the money to actually hire lawyers there. Uh, and most importantly, it's just unfair to the data provider, the data, the owners of the data that you trained it with and to the mathematicians who actually invented this. And, uh, you know, poor guys, they never patented it. They just published papers on it. And, you know, is that not injustice to them? So I think it's not even fair and not even logical in that sense, uh, the whole construct of AI patents. But Rahul, uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, you could, one could argue that, you know, the people who create the training models, they are kind of subcontractors who provide a service to the ultimate person who files for the patent. I can see the point on data, but, you know, on the models, you could argue that these guys are subcontractors, they are just, you know, work for hire kind of a thing. So, uh, so that's one argument that I can think of. The other is that, you know, if there are people like Jeff Hinton who have written papers and somebody is filing a patent on that, then you could actually invalidate that on the basis of prior art. So, uh, so then why should we be so worried about uh, AI patents? That's a great point, actually. We should dig into some of these AI patents that are being proposed to see if um, the claiming that, uh, you know, a neural network has been used and if neural network is a claim, Definitely that's invalidated because that's known in public for eight, so at least 30 years, right? And so there will be elements like that. And in fact, even folks who train those, as you rightly said, uh, you know, people who uh, massage the data, right? Or who uh, kind of annotate the data, uh, they are doing something, but they're doing it on data that may not be uh, with the right terms of service to be able to allow them to do that uh, to start with. Uh, so there's a huge argument on the data front, as you rightly said. But on the model front itself, uh, training a model is just some coefficients. You know, if you really train a model, what do you get out of it? Some mathematical coefficients. Um, think about it in a simple way. You think of, uh, you have a whole bunch of points on a graph and you want to draw a line so that you can predict the next point. You say Y equal to MX plus H and you're finding M and H, right? And so that's exactly what these kind of neural networks do in a more complex way. You're trying to find M and X, uh, H and if it's a more complex one, you're saying AX squared plus BX plus C, you're finding ABC, those coefficients. So at the end of the day, a model is nothing but a set of weights that you're finding that will help you predict the next thing accurately. Now these weights 
what are we really patenting here like five numbers five integers uh, like that doesn't seem patentable right that's not how compare this right compare this mm-hmm. to an invention in the oil and gas industry that is going to revolutionize something you know in, compare this to let's say um, let's say invention of fuel cells you know some country or company working for 20 years uh, you know are trying to invent what does uh, the next generation hydrogen cells mean and yeah they invent something finally they patent it and then they get royalty on it for whatever 10 years 20 years of that patent it is commensurate with the effort put in in these yes. cases right typically you can get a whole thing up and running in a week and you can file a patent on it that doesn't seem to be amount and intellectual property enough to really justify a patent okay i'll go to kiran uh, kiran uh, one uh, I, would, I think it will be useful for the FOSS community in India to understand how FSF uh, and you know the Open Forum Europe are pushing back against uh, software patents. How do you go about that process? Yeah, I think it's really interesting when you look at the the way to get these ideas across to the policymakers, because like when I when I started off like my my background is in software development, so I had to learn this new trade by by doing it. And I, I used to prepare meetings by looking at the background of the person I was going to meet, and I'd see, okay, this person, they're big into supporting small businesses. And, and I'd prepare, I'd find the studies, and I'd find my, my argumentation. And then I'd walk into the meeting, and I find that their their interests on this topic are, are completely different to what I expected. And so you know, quite quickly, I learned that whenever you're preparing these meetings, you have to have... 12 arguments or you know, as, as many different angles as you can think about and you just be ready to talk about whatever the policymaker wants to talk about because if you go in with the idea that they should be against this because this this is you know, bad for, this would cause more monopolies to exist in, in, in software for example, you may find that that's just not something they, they agree with or maybe not something they care about. So you know, I, I think it's a, it's a great uh, discussion about the, the business models and you know, there are business models that exist uh, that, that include software patents and you know what, what about these business models and the, the the other side of this is we have to tell them about all the business models that software patents are harming and so we have to explain to them the the companies who almost had a product ready to release and then somebody just before the release date uh, you know a competitor or you know a, a non-practicing entity uh, said, oh, I have a patent on that, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to block your release? Or are you going to pay me 10% of your income? Or so these, these types of models or the types of projects that never even got started or the projects that were being planned and people looked at the, the patent landscape and, and just said, you know, we, we can never get this done. So you have to be ready to, you know, to discuss business models if they want to discuss business models. Uh, one nice thing and one nice evolution in the past two decades is that politicians are more aware and more favorable now to free software and so it is possible to tell them that you know this would harm your government strategy on on free software and this is something that they they now care about uh, but then the other issues you know, for small and medium enterprises uh, this is a big issue for for some and it's usually an easy enough argument to make it's also a, a nice topic because there are strong lobbies already for for small businesses in most regions and so if you can uh, as well as talking to the policymakers if you can find other industries or other associations that should share our goals then this is a good way to uh, you know, to, to work together and create a, a broader coalition and this this is a, a more effective way to do the lobbying so that's it. so there's, there's you know Go on, go on. Just, just, just to give a few other uh, examples, uh, so there's, there's free software, there's business models, there's small businesses, uh, there's uh, the consumer organizations are often uh, quite well informed about how this it benefits them to have um, more people writing software, just a, a broader uh, range of, of offer for, for consumers if more people are able to write software. Uh, some policymakers like to hear economic analysis and so this is just these things exist and it's a case of um yeah having these having a list of these ready so that they can be you know quoted to policymakers that are interested in that uh, there's the issue of regions being it challengers and so for 
uh, in, in most domains, everything, everyone but the USA is a, is a challenger in terms of trying to develop or trying to become uh, the hub for certain uh, types of software. And so you, you can make the argument that with software patents, the incumbent often has patents on what is currently being used by everyone. And if you want to make a competing project, product or you want to you know, be a, a, a good, a strong competitor, you have to provide what people are already expecting, uh, including the file formats they're already using. And you know, this is very difficult to do if a lot of these ideas are patented. And so then you also have ideas, you know, things like IT celebrities. If you know, if there are very respected uh, IT scientists or, or business people, then you know, if you can get uh, endorsements from these, these can be useful. And uh, and then also you'd be able to discuss the scientific basis or the the scientific details of uh, of how software is developed. Then you know, this this is another thing that. Uh, policymakers can talk about. So I think that's more or less, you know, that's a, at least a, a starting list of, of things that you have to be able to be ready to talk on when you go into one of these meetings. So all that sounds very, you know, it sounds very easy to say, but I know that it's really hard to do. So I think, uh, you know, thanks for fighting the good fight on that. Uh, the last question before we open the floor to questions uh, to Rahul. Uh, so, Rahul, if you were to speak to Indian policymakers, uh, what would be your recommendation on software patents? I think if you look at the Indian software industry, it has gone through an amazing transformation over the last decade. Aadhaar gave everyone identity. Um, uh, thanks to UPI, we can transfer a few rupees to a fruit seller. Um, thanks to Diksha, you know, 200 million students, uh, tens of millions of teachers have access to free educational content that is used in classrooms. Thanks to Coven and Diwok, uh, not only a billion in India have been vaccinated, but another billion across multiple countries across the world have been vaccinated thanks to that software. Now, all of these pieces of software are built upon open source and are open source for others to use. Um, not one patent protects these. Else, how it would how how would it actually reach the real people who need it, right? And so, that's the macro level. Like at a macro level, I think our success over the last decade has been in spite uh, uh, thanks to no patterns and thanks to that collaborative approach existing, thanks to the open source philosophy existing, that has enabled things to be created quickly. So if you you know things that are built on you, you have MySQL, you have or Linux, you have a whole bunch of things that have been built on. If we had started creating a whole new operating system, it would have taken decades, right? It would just set us slow. And so overall, for the Indian software industry, I think building on open source and building on each other's open source, I think that's really uh, going well, and we should just continue that trend at a micro level, right? If I look at it from a, uh, from the uh, what do you call it, the mouse view, right? Uh, looking at it from the bottoms up. Imagine I'm a mobile uh, mobile manufacturer, and I want to create a mobile phone, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, let's say, how do I pick up the phone? What should be my interface there, right? What should be my front screen? The phone's ringing. How should I pick up the phone? And I say, okay, let's just do a gesture, right? Let's just swipe right, and then there is this lawyer in the room. Right? Not an engineer, a lawyer in the room. Like I'm having a product discussion with engineering, but out of the blue, it pops up a lawyer and he says, no, you cannot, you know, cannot use swipe right. Why? Because Apple has a patent on it. Like, oh, really? Okay. Um, now as an Indian software startup, right? I'm going to say, okay, let's then use the next logical basis. I'm going to get a green button and a red button. I can press the green button to take the call, red button, stop the call. Right? Easy enough. And, and maybe have a button in center that lets me move left and right towards the green and uh, red. Guess what our lawyer friend tells me? Hey, you can't do that. Google has a patent over it. Like, oh, come on. And then you say, okay, now what do I do? Make the buttons go up and down? Like, yes, exactly. But Redmi and uh, Xiaomi and others have been doing that. So you may need to actually go diagonal in terms of how you pick up the phone. Or you may have to do some voodoo magic to pick up the phone. Now, would you rather have Indian software startups, Indian mobile startups, having this discussion with a lawyer in the room about something silly as swiping left or right, just because somebody had the money to patent it? Or would you rather have a core engineering discussion to say, can I not think about picking up the phone and the phone picks up? 
can i not actually can it not sense that i am busy right now and it declines the phone i'd rather spend time on more engineering centric problems than having these mindless discussions with a lawyer who by the way is far more expensive than an engineer mm. and so it would kill the indian startup industry which is in its nascent phase i would say overall if you compare it to silicon valley and other startup capitals in the world indian startup industry is booming but yet it is yet coming of age we're still toddlers and we're learning and the last thing that we want to do is take away that time talking to engineers collaborating with engineers in an extremely collaborative ecosystem way right the whole indian ecosystem right now is built on collaboration you take upi any vm is free to create a upi app you take any of these things it's an ecosystem play there is no you can't do that and you can't do that in that open environment in that collaborative environment where day in day out we are discussing not things with our engineers but other startup engineers as well and everyone is helping us create something together in that scenario adding a lawyer to the room to kill this discussion would just be very regressive i really hope we don't get our go down that path thanks rahul i think uh, you brought out the macro and the micro the challenges to uh, you know the actual uh, day to day challenges to developers really well and uh, it reminds me of a conversation which i had with a deep tech uh, company and ask them you know why don't you patent your technology so they said that if we have say 50000 dollars to you know uh, spare I, we would rather allocate it to hiring one more engineer exactly. or a marketing guy because that you know gets our product in front of people or adds features that customers are asking for so uh, it's also quite a time consuming thing to file for patents i think uh, you know yeah one of my friends who has filed for a patent uh, in india uh, finally got it after some 6 years and uh, i think you're saying how much of time and effort it went went into you know filing for patents mm-hmm. so yeah thanks thanks for that uh, we can now open up the floor to questions uh, if there are questions please put them in chat or you know feel free to raise your hand and ask the questions I think while people are thinking of it, uh, I'll also uh, share something which I've been uh, looking at. I mean, just out of sheer curiosity, I've been. Uh, I just went to YouTube and put in a search query. You know, is maths a invention or a discovery? And uh, it's just amazing. You know, just an unbelievably fascinating rabbit hole because. you have some of the greatest mathematicians in the world uh, some of all of them have diametrically opposite opinions and one mathematician said that 40 years ago when i was a mathematician i thought it was a discovery now i think 40 years later i think that it's a invention so it just an unbelievably interesting uh, topic very cool. <laughs> oh very fascinating very fascinating do i think you can come in yeah sure uh no first i think uh, as i told you that anything that you can imagine is a reality so uh, you know I, rahul probably you know that mathematicians write down some equations and a physicist applies it to a you know natural phenomena later few hundred years later also yeah. possible like uh, galois theory group theory which we applied it to particle physics mm-hmm. you know i think 300 years Yeah. after his death anyway uh, uh rahul thanks for those comments and uh, i think uh, i completely agree with you that software patent is a uh, is an oxymoron especially when we are going to uh, you know uh, thanks for uh, uh, explaining in simple terms uh, you know it will be very useful for me <laughs> who lectures a lot on ai to uh, from regression to uh, neural networks you know just we are talking about weights so uh, yeah i mean uh, i think uh, is it uh, see unless you know software uh, is coupled with a uh, you know very uh, different kind of hardware i don't think uh, there is any point in patenting it in you know in a typical uh, uh, you know op- things if i if i create uh, you know for an industrial process for uh, you know for an automation for for, uh, for an aircraft tra- uh, transmission if i create a software 
then yes it can be patented but uh, a, in a normal uh, our typical day to day hardware uh, things and i think venki agrees with me here that for a day to day kind of hardware you know uh, typical no commercially available computers if i write a software i think it should it is sort of it is my duty that i share it and no no not file pe file a patent so uh, Uh, i mean i am proud that when i was heading research of uh, the you know the core research lab in infosys i never allowed my uh, team to file patents but uh, you know before and after that of course infosys had a lot of money so i hope this is <laughs> not recorded and held <laughs> but i i never never allowed them anybody to file patents it's recorded amon <laughs> <laughs> play it to nandan <laughs> I, I see that Shubham has a has his hand up. Shubham, can you ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Shubham. Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a public policy student, uh, and uh, I'm actually researching on this uh, uh, area of uh, uh, software patents and innovation under the guidance of uh, Vikas. so uh, i i uh, during the course i came across lot of literature i mean lot of research mostly centered in the eu around uh, 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 how how this impacts innovation and how what is how uh, and uh, the similar arguments similar outcomes came out that you know mostly large companies have cornered it uh, uh, the smaller firms are getting adversely affected mm -hmm. so uh, uh since i'm looking at this in the indian context uh, so i wanted to know from you that uh, what is the level of awareness around about patents or uh, even the impact since litigation rates are much less uh, in india so uh, what is say the level of awareness around especially with respect to smaller firms who are probably developing something who as uh, uh, i mean on the similar lines the example you mentioned Uh, on the call receiving so do they have that level of awareness that something is patented and i'm infringing on it and maybe someone is coming in so uh, just you don't use use the question to directed to is it to uh, miss, sorry it's to mr rahul uh, if uh, or anyone i mean who is knowledgeable on on this area okay. rahul can you take that sure i can i can start with some part of it i think there's a it's a great question uh, you know so i'm glad you're a student and deep, deep diving into areas like this so first of all kudos on doing that um, it's a tricky topic now uh, let's say in terms of awareness right let's say break down your question so one part the last part that you were asking was around is there awareness in these startups or companies actually using that awareness about patents awareness about these things um now awareness has increased over time so i would say the awareness right now is about not using a non open source license uh, in software and so you typically uh, you know in a startup and all you typically tend to tell uh, engineers to pick libraries that are mit or apache license um or then if you are a foundation or you are uh, if you are business model supports it and you are doing a gpl license then you need to also open source your software and so there are certain restrictions so uh, mostly startups basically say if it's apache or mit license go for it um if it is non mit or apache you know beware that is the level of awareness right this i'm talking about copyright and licensing not even patents so patent violation and everything is not even a thought right now i would think the awareness is pretty low Uh, the awareness is also low because you've not gotten you don't have stories around that you've gotten hit by it uh, yeah. you know at a at a micro level and so and why is that you would see a lot of patents almost conflicting each other almost the saying the same thing in different words um, it's a lawyer magic right it's at the end of the day it is a uh, text magic with uh, the way lawyers can weave something around it for example one of my patents is around um encryption at rest it is about if you are storing a data on a server and it's encrypted supposedly that's a patent that i filed of course i am just the filer uh, the filer or the assignee is google but does that mean nobody else can ever you know have data encrypted at rest on a server clearly it's not that way right everything is encrypted at rest now so everyone is violating the patent everyone is paying google a royalty 
I'm not aware of that. I don't know how is that working. Why? Because everyone has workarounds. You take that same text and you add three extra clauses. You say, oh, it is not about data on a server. It's about data on a computing device that is sitting remotely in a cloud. Like, dude, that's a server. But no, in lawyer language, that means something different. And so patents are about uh, working your way around smart English um, to kind of get away from what you're trying to do. And you can always excuse yourself to say, oh, this is different. This is different and you will let lawyers battle it out. When it comes to core engineering, I think in terms of um, software libraries and so on, the construct of um, MID license, Apache license, uh, you know, uh, GPL licenses are well understood in the uh, software community. And so people are aware of that and know how to balance that and, uh, you know, stay away from trouble. But patents, nobody even knows that because finally it goes down to a lawyer that no engineer really understands what's going on. I think um, I can second that, you know, uh, because the other hat I wear is also that of the India representative for the Open Invention Network. And I've been doing that now for about, uh, what, almost about 10 years. And in that role, I've reached out to a whole bunch of organizations to explain to them what software patents are. And uh, my observation has been that uh, the ones who really, you know, understand what we are talking about are people who have worked abroad, filed patents, come back to India uh, and are now CTOs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, most of the rest of the people, I think I would say one in one or two people in hundred understand the issue of software patents, but the rest of them confuse copyrights, patents, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, Kiran, you wanted to say something. Yeah, so, so there were quite a few interesting points raised there. So one issue is that sometimes people can look around and see no litigation happening. So there might be very little software patent litigation happening in India. And people might ask then, well, is this even a problem? And so there you have to you know, tell people about the, the problem of, of risk and like once software patents might be valid, there's always this, this risk that, that people are afraid of and it makes it difficult for companies to collaborate with each other. It also means that it, if software patents are valid in other regions, it makes it difficult for a software project to grow because you might be able to develop your software in India, but then once you want to do a collaboration with somebody who is in uh, a region where there are software patents, uh, then they might say, well, you know, have you done due diligence and have you checked all the software patents in my part of the world to see if your software uh, might violate some of those? And so in that sense, it, it makes it difficult for a small project to grow into a medium project. Uh, but sometimes the, the, the legislation is linked to the idea that if we have these, we'll get more investment because more IT companies might might come to, to our region. And in a way, this is actually this is completely backwards because if you have, if there's only one region in the world with no software patents, then that's basically the safe place to develop software. So, yeah. in, in a sense, having no software patents is how you is how, how you would attract software development to take place in your country, in your region. Uh, so, and then just the, the last thing on software licenses, uh, the the interesting thing about the GPL. It has a very good patent clause and the uh, Apache uh, 2.0 has a very similar and equally good patent clause. But the advantage of the GPL is that because it's copyleft and because all future versions have to also be under the GPL, if you use the GPL, then you know that anyone who collaborates with you in the future is not going to turn into an enemy. They can't be a collaborator and then at the same time say, you know, I can continue distributing, but actually, you know, you're uh, at the mercy of my patent. So in this sense, if you want to keep your software safe against patents, then using the GPL is a, a good strategy. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Rahul had a question. Go on, Rahul. Uh, hello, folks. Um, so we have talked about, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to formulate my question. Uh, so, 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 I think one of the broader things that I've uh, uh, taken away from the panel discussion has been, uh, I think, sort of top-down approaches to how we can solve this problem, right? Uh, so, we're talking about changes to uh, uh, global and national level policy and what changes we can do and how we can go about convincing policymakers and so on. Um, while the panel discussion was happening, I uh, uh, wandered around the Indian uh, Patent Office website and I was trying to look through 
how many patents were uh, filed with the patent office over the last month uh, and it, it's about like a thousand patents which have been you know like filed and which seem to be uh, under review uh, so one question that I had was, so we need multiple approaches. So for example, Sierra, you mentioned that we always need to go with multiple different like, uh, uh, answers and approaches to try and convince policymakers that look, here are all the answers that you need, pick whichever works best for you. Uh, so in a similar way, I was just trying to wonder, like does a bottom up approach where we are trying to actually uh, uh, create material for people who are working at the patent offices. Uh, how do we get them to understand uh, 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 what we are trying to talk about? Right? So we are we're talking about uh, uh, big picture changes to policy. How do we also try and get them educated in trying them and, and, and help them understand, hey, look, if you are seeing a patent which is very trivial and is built on top of neural networks and simple math, then here is how you actually understand it. Um, I, I, I can understand a response where it's simply the patent office's responsibility to create this material, but given the fact that we're in this fight, I, I'm just wondering if it's also our responsibility to create this. This is a question to everybody on the panel. Yeah, so Rahul, uh, the Software Freedom Law Center had drafted a three-part test on uh, how to evaluate uh, software patents. And uh, basically what happened is that that was brought, that was accepted in 2016 and then i think uh, there was a lot of lobbying and pushback so it was finally then you know overturned so currently uh, that particular three part test has been taken out of the patent manual so so the answer is yes you know we have to kind of help the software patent office and the patent examiners in the indian patent office Maybe Kieran can uh, talk a little bit about ESF Wiki. Uh, that's yeah. a fascinating concept and I think that speaks to Rahul's question on educating uh, people who are dealing with this. Uh, I don't know, yeah. anything you can share, Kieran? Uh, how how has that worked out for you? Yeah, Kieran, if you can make a quick intervention. After that, uh, Srijit is asking a question. We'll you go to him quickly. Okay, well then I'll just mention the, maybe if somebody can put the link in the chat, but there is a wiki on the End Software Patents Project. And the idea is that for each time a campaign has to be worked on, we always spend time gathering information, economic analysis, case studies, samples, all, all these different documents. And basically we should really collaborate. And so that after each campaign, this treasure chest of knowledge should be more and more useful. And so there's a lot of information there already, uh, but if more people could contribute to the, the, the wiki, wiki.endsoftwarepatents.org, I believe is the, yep, uh, that, that would be fantastic. But um, well, uh, just a small comment on lobbying patent offices in some regions, it's very difficult. And so usually we have to find court cases and present the court cases to the patent offices or talk to legislators and ask them to communicate with the patent office. But yeah, it varies from region to region. So Srijit, uh, the yeah. last question goes to you. Yeah, uh, I, I actually had a question to Rahul. Uh, so uh, I actually agree with your uh, larger argument, although uh, I have uh, some confusion or uh, a uh, sort of uh, question around it. So you seem to say that software is a uh, scientific artifact. That seems to be your uh, sort of argument. Uh, but I seem to disagree with that. My view is that uh, software is more like artistic or craft sort of uh, artifact. So if you look at uh, you know music, it's like you have uh, core uh, chords, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then you are putting it together to uh, create. Uh, something putting some product together right mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. some performance together yeah. so uh, 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 so if you if you see it as a scientific artifact of course uh, you know uh, controlling it or taking property over it doesn't make sense but at the same time if you look at music uh, there is no fundamental idea like you are not inventing a new raga or something like that but uh, you definitely uh, have some sort of ownership over it so yeah. Yeah. For example, if you're A.R. Rahman, yeah. of course, he, he put something together. So. Yeah. No, no, wonderful point, Shrijit. Very, very nice point. Beautifully laid out. Um, and, and to that, right, uh, I've also thought about music, right? Can music be patented? And music can be copyrighted, not patented. Right, yeah. and yeah. I think the same thing applies for software. Software can be copyrighted. Yes, you wrote the software; it's yours. You know, you should nobody should just copy paste it and use it if you choose not to. 
and so software copyrights make a lot of sense uh, but exactly. patents per se don't and so yeah i think that that is a easy analogy to kind of digest music and whatever applies to music i think that could apply to software too i agree with your analogy that look it's not purely scientific right scientific is math but the moment you kind of put it into nice functions and make it do things magically have a beautiful ui and experience you know, suddenly you're getting into the uh, you know artistic domain and then it's no longer scientific and uh, there is got to be some right there and maybe that right is copyright uh, but not patent a great point uh, shrijit anybody has any other question uh, if not i'll just uh, you know do the vote of thanks and uh, we can go off record i think some some of us can stay back uh, Hey, uh, one one thing i just wanted to add venki uh, to you know uh, there are folks like shubham and uh, you know uh, young folks who are in the policy world another thing that we did not cover that maybe you know, food for thought to all the policy folks in the room while we are debating patterns at a micro level right what is the impact on industry how does the industry think about it engineers think about it um, the bottom line is people want some measure for innovation and at the end of the day the reason why people bank on patent so much is oh i have nine patents and oh i have 32 patents and india has 20000 patents filed every year you know that is the number which has been uh, construed as synonymous or as a proxy for innovation and it couldn't be more incorrect but that's a perception that's a perception that we need to change and so as policy folks can you think of a uh, Uh, creating metrics or evangelizing metrics that are better metrics for um, for policy creation uh, for uh, for judging innovation in a country beyond just patents you know that shouldn't be the proxy for innovation so yeah. just uh, tip for getting something around and uh, that'll be a huge service you can do to not just india but the world across the board yeah shri uh, can you just quickly mm. ask Yeah, yeah, actually, my question was exactly on the same point that he's just brought up, right? Okay. So, okay. which is about you know, uh, so I was also looking around, you know, how much percentage of patents filed in which countries are related to what, you know, that kind of an angle. And it turns out that about sixty percent of the U.S. patents have some relationship with software, and forty percent China have some relationship with software in twenty twenty one. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you know now when you go and speak to a public policy maker who's trying to get these numbers up i mean we are great at manufacturing numbers right you tell us any numbers we manufacture them, right <laughs> it's kind of very difficult uh, you know in every country also even the smaller co- countries uh, smaller companies i know uh, they are at least trying to uh, file patents in india because it's cheaper yeah right so and well most of them are doing software because doing hardware is of course much more capital intensive right i work mm-hmm. in a embedded systems by the way so i work with hardware but i know that a lot of people do software because it's just cheaper right yeah. so i think that- i have uh, dropped my email id in the chat uh, just curious to know why you are doing this uh, but we can take that offline because yeah. we are running out of time we are out at the 5 o'clock mark and uh, i'm sure many of you have other calls to attend so very quickly you know uh, kiran thanks so much for you know sharing the global perspective on and you know also fsf and uh, the open forum europe perspective on uh, end software patents campaign and uh, and rahul thank you so much for you know sharing uh, your perspective as a software developer uh, and a patent holder on why you think uh, software patents are a bad idea with that uh, i would like to thank uh, also i would like to thank riya and vishal from Force United for you know helping me organize this particular program. So thank you so much, and uh, you know we we will share a recording of this discussion uh, on the Force United YouTube channel soon. Thanks. Thank everybody. you very much. Thank, thank you very, very much for the invitation as well. Thank you.